I'm Ryan, and this is 52 SE Friday, week seven. What is the Softies collection? Does easy, low cost, and the fastest grow out of dozens of coral types with endless color variations speak to you? If so, what are the challenges, and how do we intend to solve them? All that is coming up. Well, soft corals do live on reefs. They're unique from everything else that we've done so far in that they're not reef building corals. They don't lay down calcium carbonate skeletons that grow reef structure but they are often mixed among them. But they also do dominate areas that they're found in and completely different vantage points of a reef. Other times growing where many stony corals are less likely to grow and sometimes even isolated flowing amongst the ocean's currents. Well, soft coral does have some scientific meaning for specific types of coral that don't have calcium carbonate skeletons, but it doesn't include all the corals that share that trait. A softies collection is a hobbyist term that's more flexible and can mean what you want it to mean in our case, expanded to nearly anything without a stony skeleton. In our softies collection, you'll see corals like popular toadstools, mesmerizing corals like pulsing xenia, similar but different clove polyps, a softy tank favorite with cinularia, mushroom corals like recordia, reef tank favorites like zoanthids, potentially challenging corals like carnation coral. Gorgonians, and for my first time, maybe learn what it takes to attempt some of those non-photosynthetic gorgonians, a variety of rhodactis mushrooms, green star polyps, and their sea of wavy grass, Kenya tree corals looking for some of the coolest variants we can find. We're even going to push the limits on what a softies collection means with the addition of another animal that doesn't have a calcium carbonate skeleton, flows in the currents, and live amongst the reefs but doesn't build them rock flower anemones, one of the coolest and lowest cost methods of adding colorful life to the tank. Our mission with today's episode, most of our collection of softies may be perfect for newer reefers, those who want to fill out the tank faster and spend less money on coral. But we're also going to show how to build an epic display that respects these animals' biology. The primary habitat challenge is these corals grow faster than many SPS or LPS corals and some are better at encroaching and overpowering their neighbors. They do better when you can find ways to isolate or separate them to some degree. Our solution, the Max Spec Aquarium, is coming to the U.S. fairly soon. This is a kit aquarium that we thought was perfect for a tank like this one where beautiful but easy is part of the theme. The tank comes with its own return pump, skimmer, ATO box, power head, system monitor, power solution, and optional lights, all integrated into a single solution. Howard did a video with that that shares all of the details. Our solution, the Aquascape, is the second NSA I ever built, and I'm excited to put it to use. It has lots of isolated ledges, which are tilted forwards for front viewing, open design, which allows for upward growth on some of the larger corals, shaded ledges for lower light corals. The new addition is our fish hotel, which is designed to look like a single rock, but really a network of holes designed to provide habitat for sleeping fish or those looking to escape aggression. Our fish hotel here, just 20 or so pieces of broken Marco rock reassembled into a network of holes. This scape was built primarily with super glue gel as the base, but mortar holding the pieces together long term. And there is a how to video called How to NSA Aquascape. There's another approach though called How to H NSA for those who prefer epoxy over mortar and want to build additional fish homes into the scape itself. For those looking for something similar but can be done in just minutes without any adhesive, the Carib Sea trees use a base with three arch pieces and a few rods to assemble something that looks similar to this but just in minutes. In a five foot tank like this one, I'd probably use three kits and it would end up looking like this type of aquascape, same open format with a lot of isolated ledges, perfect for a softy collection. For biome cycling the tank, we use ocean direct sand mixed with a few pounds of TBS sand, both sands from the ocean with natural bacteria, some Tampa Bay saltwater rubble in the filter cup, Algae Barnes Galaxy Pods for micro crustaceans and pods, Dr. Tim's one and only to protect that first batch of fish, and Brightwell's Microbacter 7, which has become a primary tool to limit and fight pest slimes common to new tanks. The lighting challenge is this is effectively a mixed tank where high light corals, low light corals, and potentially no light corals are all housed in the same tank. The other challenge is that some of the corals get really big, they'll heavily shade those below. Our solution is the same one that solved similar issues in the LPS and SPS tank and a three point hybrid of Kessel A360s as a primary lights and shimmer coupled with a pair of AI blade glows and grows for fill light to reduce the effects of coral shading. These are the settings we use to tune the spectrum with a blue range similar to that found about 15 feet deep in the tropics we refer to as solar blue. That tunes shooting for a safe zone of par. There isn't really an agreed upon ideal par zone for all of these corals because they're all so different. 
but there is what I believe to be a safe zone of 150 to 250 par for most of these corals. Note that if they don't look good, moving them to a lower light zone is 100 times more likely to solve that than increasing the par. Par tuned with a meter that looks like this one, something that we encourage be bought, used, and returned with an open box charge because it's an invaluable tool, but likely only be used once for 10 minutes and then never again. Lighting's a decisive topic. Just note that a blanket of light that balances violet, indigo, and blue light, solves shading, and taking the time to tune par will define success more than anything else. We did that using the AI Blade LED strips in the front and back of the tank, but if the tank's budget demands it, a very similar result at a lower cost could be achieved with Kessels in the Aquatic Life T5 hybrid fixture and a pair of Aqua Blue Specials and Atinic lamps, par intensity tuned with mounting height. An easier to tune and mount solution, three ultra wide angle modules like the Radeon XR30 with our solar blue tune oriented front to back. Then adjusted with the par meter and the intensity slider that evenly scales the spectrum is a very popular solution because ease of mounting and use is a priority for a vast majority of reefers. The gas exchange solution here recognizes that high light corals often require more flows to support rapid respiration than low light corals, but the lack of calcium carbonate skeleton in soft tissue structure doesn't withstand a lot of flow. It's a conundrum. Our solution uses two gyres that come with the tank kit and position them on the back to provide laminar flow. One of the pump heads angled towards the front on the top and the other on the bottom angled behind the rockwork done on both sides, essentially creating four different pump heads in one. The Maxpec jump skimmer whisking all the air and water for much of the tank's oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange needs with the room. In the event of a power outage, we have a large computer UPS which will drive the pumps for a limited amount of time and cost effective. The Apex Junior monitor heartbeat solution letting us know immediately so we can solve until the power comes back on. The beauty of a softy system is minimal chemistry challenges and why it's an ideal skill set and fit for newer reefers. While most coral tanks need more advanced calcium and alkalinity and pH management and then monitoring as well, a softy tank is much less so. There will be some very minimal calcium and alkalinity consumption from the coralline algae and the coral's microskeleton or sclerites that help give the coral some form, but much less than other coral types with full calcium carbonate skeletons. Our solution for this tank, all for reef from Tropic Marin, it's a true one part in a concentrated form, dosed with a one head versa doser. Trace element uptake and replenishment handled with what's in the all for reef and imbalances muted with our 1.25% daily auto water change, 10% weekly and 35% monthly producing very similar results. The one caveat is iodine. Many reefers believe that iodine dosing is beneficial in a softy tank, but we're going to go without that and add it in if necessary. Evaporation handled with the included ATO box, which is a clever use of space. The ATO kept full with a gravity fed solution directly from our RODI with the Tunes oscillator and solenoid water safety valve, keeping it full with zero effort. The challenge in a take like this one is a lot of tissue production, which is comprised of about half protein, one third fats and lipids, and the rest carbohydrates and minerals. While most are photosynthetic, many soft corals are dependent on zooplankton, bacterioplankton, or other organic food particles. This is something you can see with the naked eye. Many have adapted very elaborate polyp structures for capturing this prey or nutrition. Our solution twofold, both easy. Once the tank has a healthy amount of coral, Brightwell's coral amino supporting the production of protein. The coral's tissue is made of about half protein, and protein is basically just amino acids assembled back together. Amino acids are the one tank additive that nearly every tank benefits from. Second, a healthy amount of high energy fish, related organic food, and nutrition rich organic waste particles. In our case, a school of antheas that are fed about every other hour on an AFS auto feeder. The dissolved amino acids and organic particles from food and waste, very likely enough for most of the corals. However, some of the non photosynthetics, and when the tank is very well stocked, the addition of particulate based foods like reef chili or Brightwell's Reef Blizzard may be introduced. These are a wide range of particle sized foods for a wide range of coral polyps, sizes, and structures. Another beauty of a softy collection is once it's established with a lot of coral, pollution is rarely a problem. The corals themselves become the nutrient uptake and typically grow fast enough that they need to be pruned back or harvested. The nutrients removed from the tanks when they're tied up in the frags and effectively making the tank a coral refugium. There's one exception to that related to the toxin that these corals produce that we'll get to in just a moment. 
In the first 12 to 18 months, our solution to pollution and filtrations called SPDID, which targets specific types of organics and inorganic pollutants at different stages deliberately with goals. As for suspension, it's our hope that the strong currents from the two gyres and fairly open scape will keep most of the waste suspended for the corals to capture and the filtration to remove. But this is admittedly one of the fewest pumps that we've put in any of these tanks. Flow is one of those things that you'll just never know for sure until the tank goes live. It's easy to add more flow and the right type of flow once you recognize the dead spots or coral behavior. P for particulate organics, we won't be using any type of particulate organic filtration to remove food or waste particles for two reasons. One, the sump's only equipped for filter socks rather than a roller. Filter socks need to be swapped out every three days or all they do is capture particles and let them rot and effectively making the other filters less aggressive. If you could fit in an automatic roller in the sump, I'd likely use that because it doesn't require as much maintenance. The second reason is the corals effectively eat these organic particles, so I don't want to remove that food, but it does mean the rest of our filtration game needs to be strong. D for dissolved organics. Dissolved organics is what's left over after the particles break down into proteins and smaller molecules. The MaxSpec Jumps Protein Skimmer is going to be our primary dissolved organic pollution export. The skimmer upgraded with the ozone kit and the Ozotech ozone generator. Ozone does a few things on a tank like this. The ozone breaks down and effectively eliminates odors from the tank. The yellow pigments in the water are also a thing of the past, but ozone is even more valuable in a tank like this one that has a higher concentration of organic toxins produced by the soft corals fighting each other, as well as other undesirable toxins like palytoxin from zoanthids. Breaking these toxins down and removing them is both good for the corals so they don't have to fight each other, as well as the reefer who puts their hands in the tank or even potentially breathes small amounts of these toxins when they're aerosolized by the skimmer. These type of toxins are known to exist in the tank, but poorly understood past that, but also simple to reduce. Using activated carbon is a great way to capture many of these toxins, and we're going to do that in the filter cup, but there's ways to go even beyond that. In one of our experiments, we found that the Ozotech ozone unit on a skimmer set to one of its lowest settings, ORP controlled to stay below 450 and only on for about an hour from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. completely eliminates all of the dissolved organic yellow pigments from the water, and even after several months of feeding and no water changes. This is what the controls of no ozone look like compared to the small amount of daily ozone one hour night. The lack of yellow pigments, not only desirable for the tank, but indicative of how the other undesirable organic compounds are being oxidized and broken down as well. Not fully understood yet, but anecdotally, in many of these cases, the small amount of ozone also reducing or eliminating undesirable slimes. You'll notice that ozone's on every tank that we can fit it on now. Full converters, once we found an easy way to do it, which is safe for the tank and minimal ozone in the room by running just one hour night in ORP control. I for inorganic pollutants. Inorganic pollutants mean the eventual breakdown of foods into just nitrate and phosphate handled with the refugium, Cato from Algae Barm, Cato Grow from Brightwell to resupply the elements that Cato uses, and two aqua chic refugium lights from Tunes would fit the space well and most popular fuge, the BRS cells. The purple light intended to be more efficient use of LEDs, but we might explore the full spectrum or 10K option, and it's waterproof, so we may explore lighting the cato from underneath as well, which is something that we've never done, but if needed, likely a way to increase filter performance. The cato based refugium is in the midst of a conundrum where nearly everyone understands it's the easiest and arguably the best solution for managing low nitrate and phosphate. It elevates the pH at night, so the lighting period starts higher, becomes a safe haven farm of desirable microcrustaceans like pods, and leaks nutrition like carbohydrates to the corals. To be frank, it's also how nature harvests excess pollution. Yet, for some reason, knowing that to be true, refugiums are still in a relatively small portion of tanks and not the most popular filter. But that isn't because of performance, and it's on all of our systems that we've done in this series. D for dilution, dilution and replenishment of recycled water with fresh water done with 1.25% daily water changes on the dose auto water change. Again, similar to 10% weekly and 35% monthly by hand. Dilution will reduce nutrient-based pollution that we measure, but also everything that we don't. And to some degree, it will also replenish elements that are taken out of the water. In the end, it's also the insurance against thousands of different mistakes that reefers make every day. I'd go as far as to say how often and how much and how diligent a reefer is about water changes is the best predictor of how successful they'll be. This becomes even more true the smaller the tank is and the newer the reefer is. Yet another nice thing about soft corals is they have way fewer parasites and those that they do have are easier to spot and deal with. 
standard dips and looking at what's in the dips is the best tell. This is another area where Melanaris and Chorus Rasses are helpful at hunting down the ones you miss. For fish parasites, same as the other tanks here, we suggest getting the fish from somewhere that proactively treats for the common parasites like ick, velvet, brook, flukes, and uranema. We use marine collectors for that service here, but these tanks are in contact with a lot of other tanks and coral introductions here, so in the event of an introduction, we proactively run UV to limit parasite population growth with the Aqua Ultraviolet 57 Watt UV. Note that in many cases, the easiest install and later maintenance is just to stand it up in the sump like we've done here. Temperature and thermal energy is a big conversation that we'll have in the science episodes, but for this tank, we're running two BRS titanium heaters run by the Apex and backed up with the innovative marine controller. Heaters are the biggest tank killer out there, but with redundant controllers monitoring alarms, this tank will be in the sub 1% club and not a problem. In the event of the HVAC going out or other issues, the tunes AquaChic fan cooling the tank through evaporation and heat energy release. Everything we just set up may sound like gear and equipment, but it's just things that adjust the environment of our studio here to match the environment 10 to 50 feet underwater in the tropics. The Maxbeck tank comes with its own monitor to make sure much of that is working with temperature and level sensors, as well as ways to adjust your pumps. Even beyond that, if you use their lights and fuge solutions. In addition, we added a Neptune Junior, which is a monitor only, which will check for leaks, pH, backup temp sensor, power outage alarms, and other sensors. The Junior also controls our dose-based auto water change solution. We also added a single outlet bar so we can add some automatic redundancy to important features, like only having the fan on when needed. It turns our ozone solution on and off based on time and ORP gives us the ability to toggle equipment on and off remotely and with the PM1 module pairs with our adaptive reef interface board to do push button water changes, feed modes, toggling lights, maintenance modes and turn the entire system or various components on and off with the flip of a switch. Big question is why the Junior plus the outlet strip and not the Apex Pro like all the other tanks so far in 52SE? The answer is part of the Softy collection is supposed to be easier and somewhat lower cost as well. The Apex Junior plus EB832 is close to half the cost of the Pro and does 80% of what reefers need. Double so when it's done in connection with the monitor incorporated into the Maxpec tank, which adds redundancy as well. That's the mission with the Softy's collector's tank, but next week. Part of 52SE is not just the BRS TV team sharing everything that we know, but also bringing in our peers and some of the most successful reefers, farmers, and marine biologists in our hobby. Next Saturday and Sunday, 52 SE is live at Reefapalooza, Texas with Josh, Director of Operations at the WWC Farm. We're taking your questions about what you've seen in 52 SE as well as some cool topics of our own. Join us at RAP Texas next weekend if you can. Otherwise, share your questions in the comments and we'll answer those things live. These episodes found in the full 52 SE playlist right here.